right down to 600 BC. This is the era that the J, the E, the P, and the D sources arose. And this is the era that they were put together, possibly after the Babylonian captivity, but the sources themselves date before Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem. So this is interesting. This is the same time frame as the Book of Mormon. So it's fascinating that the Book of Mormon consistently matches one of those sources, the E source, which has to do with the north. Beautiful consistency here, isn't it? So careful reading of the allegory of the olive tree from Zenus, as well as Alma 33, 3 through 17, and these concern both Zenus and Zenic, this further confirms a context of sinful Israel more reminiscent of the time of Amos, who lived in the mid-8th century BC. So this is the same time you're here. Moreover, Zenic was said to be a prophet of old. This is how the Book of Mormon understood him. Whenever they would quote him, they would say, as the prophet of old, Zenus. But this epithet, prophet of old, was never applied to either Isaiah or Jeremiah. Now, Isaiah lived during the time the Assyrians came and took the northern tribes away. This was about 722 B.C. But Isaiah is never called the prophet of old. But Zenus and Zenic are. So, the hint is that they lived before Isaiah. And they are in the records of the brass plates, which has to do with northern Israel, not the biblical record dealing with southern Judah. That's why we don't find Zenus and Zenic in the Bible. They weren't in Jerusalem. They were in the north, prophesying to the northern tribes. This is so interesting how this fits. <clears throat> the probability is high, therefore, that the prophets cited from the brass plates date between 900 B.C. and the end of the Northern Kingdom in 721 B.C. So, now we're getting a time frame here that's very interesting. They were before Isaiah, but they existed in the united monarchy of King David's empire. Well, Lehi's connection with the Joseph of Egypt... This is emphasized in the blessing that he pronounces on his own son, Joseph, just at his deathbed, his last will and testament. A beautiful testamentary genre of literature, which has been confirmed now through archaeology of discovered texts. This is precisely what the grand old man, the patriarch, did with his family. He gathered them and gave his kids blessings. This is the testamentary literature. The Book of Mormon fits that genre. Well, he's talking about Joseph of Egypt to his own young son, Joseph, who was also born in the wilderness of his tribulation as they were making their way to the new world. Now, when Lehi there asserts, For behold, I am a descendant of Joseph, who was carried captive into Egypt, there can be no question that his information was derived from the brass plates, since when he first inspected those brass plates is when Lehi understood that he was a descendant of Joseph of Egypt. So the emphasis here in the Book of Mormon is on Joseph, not Judah. He finally continues on to communicate additional information about Joseph, finally quoting at some length a prophecy that Joseph gave that we don't have in the Bible. Of course not. Because the Bible was not concerned with Joseph. It was concerned with Judah. Isn't that interesting? This prophecy came off of the brass plates, which is another source that Judah in the south did not have access to. It was taken by Lehi. Very interesting here. This added information and the genealogical tie again point our attention to the northern kingdom, and this is the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh not Judah in the south. I know I'm making a big deal about this, but I want to make sure you understand in your mind the difference here. Whenever we say Israel, we don't mean Israel in the Bible. Israel are the northern tribes above Judah in the north. The Bible deals only with Judah, pretty much, as a general rule. Its emphasis is on Judah. So, and here again, 
because of the archaeology and the history of this particular area, Jerusalem, Palestinian era, era, area, we know because of the cultural influence dominating Egypt coming up from the south after the Assyrians were wiped out and destroyed, between 700 BC and earlier even, and 600 BC, there was a strong Egyptian influence culturally and politically. Well, and militarily, as far as that goes, Josiah was killed in a war against the Egyptians. And Josiah was the king that Lehi would have known. But this influence of Egypt, of the tradition and the language that is manifest in the Book of Mormon, is also coordinate with the Joseph element in the brass plates. How so? Here's why. Nephi states that his record consisted of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. That's the very first page. This could equally be said of an inscription on the back of one of the carved ivories from Samaria. Now remember, Samaria is not in Judah, it's in the north. A carved ivory. This has had Egyptian glyphs were used in a cartouche apparently to spell out the sounds in a Hebrew name, Eliashib. Very interesting. Hugh Nibley's Lehigh in the Desert documents extensive Egyptian cultural ties among the Nephites. This supports a far more fundamental connection than mere trade exposure in the time of Lehi. Lehi's purpose in obtaining the record, what was the point? Here was the point. Was that we may preserve unto our children the language of our fathers, not merely the language of Lehi's trade transactions, but the language of our fathers. It is also to be noted that Lehi was trade, international, and desert-oriented. Such characteristics are congruent with the northern-centered E tradition. So now we're beginning to see one point, two points, three points, four points, and they're all going in the same direction. Perfectly consistent. The emphasis in the Book of Mormon, because of their finding the brass plates, comes from a northern E-source tradition. Their entire understanding of their prophecies, of their lives, of the prophets and their religion, their very culture, the manner in which they kept their records, is based upon the E Northern tradition of the documentary hypothesis. That is so fascinating to see this. Beautiful. So, other significant data on Northern Kingdom Ephraimite inclusions and orientations in the Book of Mormon deriving from the brass plates are also understood. Laban's treasury had these brass plates as just one of the records. The specific ones Lehi's sons went and got. And this is a, virgin, a version of the Old Testament. Yeah, a version of the Old Testament. Yeah, woohoo! This is a version of the Old Testament with special Northern Kingdom characteristics. Now, E was fundamentally a Northern Kingdom expression. And, and uh, Richard Elliott Friedman points this out time and time and time again in his books. It truly is. This is not just a fluke. This is how it works. <laughs> this is the basis of the evidence on the biblical record. And now that we use this context to explore the Book of Mormon record, we see, aha, we can match these same characteristics of a northern kingdom Israel with the Book of Mormon and the e-source in the Bible. It's wonderful how this works. Now, according to William F. Albright, one of the greatest biblical archaeologists in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, he says the E-source gives strong indications of being an official rewriting of the J-source. So the J-source was first, but it was in Judah. It was in the southern kingdom. Well, the northern tribes needed their own scriptures, so someone rewrote the J-version, but they had a northern kingdom bias as they put their source of the scriptures together. See how this works. The Book of Mormon reflects that bias. It's so fascinating how it does that.